Welcome to the Cherry Picker, the horror movie podcast where we like to kill people, but not really. I'm your host, Zach Cherry, and with me as always... You will eat less than you desire, and more than you deserve. It's a pleasure to serve you, Eddie of Edward is Truth. Hi. You're getting so predictable, I knew... I knew I was just watching that, <laughs> and that line came it up. It was like, perfect. I bet that's the one he's gonna do. Hey, I'm not here to please you, okay? <laughs> I need us to be pleased. I Sometimes fucking... I just want to be surprised. Oh, Elsa. The menu. My God. Yeah. November eighteenth, two thousand twenty-two release date, and God. you. This was a treat for you. You've never seen this before. Okay. Yeah, and I didn't yeah. know anything about it going in. I I had one, uh, uh, I, I had an exchange with uh, Eric Champney. Hi, Eric, um, who told me basically Anya Taylor Joy is miscast, and I was like, all right, well, no more, please. And uh, <laughs> and as I watched it, I disagree. Miscast. And uh, well, you can talk about that. I, I think I know, we, we didn't get into it because I hadn't seen the movie yet, but I think I understand maybe what where he was coming from, but it doesn't mean I agree with it, and I don't. Okay. I don't. So, that's okay, one yeah. thing. <laughs> bone to pick there, but... Um, yeah, but, uh, it was really interesting to watch this for the second time, because I watched this initially when it was released in the theater, and I bought it because mm-hmm. I really liked it and i was saving it obviously for this podcast and just watching it again i love that first of all this is a movie that you don't like i wouldn't call this a twisty movie by any means but Mm. it's a movie where we don't know everything going through Mm. it and there's little bits of information that come available as we move along which makes this like so interesting considering that it's all set in like the same room like it's it's it, like it's, yeah. a, it's a play essentially um but yeah. here i lost my train of thought um it's watching it the second not a, time not a twisty movie <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah even though there are twists but but watching it a second time it was like noticing things that were always there the first time but just seeing them uh within a different context now that you know the outcome or you know where the movie's going, which makes, and you know, I'll always say is like rewatchability factor makes the best movies. Like anything that I can watch and then watch again and again is, is the testament to a great movie. And Mm -hmm. I loved this the second time even more because it was, it was like watching a totally different movie. Right. Um, I agree. Also, I got, I had the, uh, opportunity because i watched it uh pretty soon before like i was uh setting up for this and everything like that and getting ready to record yeah um and i saw i saw it you know like soon enough that like i was even craving a cheeseburger because uh the movie did that to me as well so uh (laughs) i drove to del taco i got a cheeseburger i got crinkle cut fries because uh, i wanted those too and um and i'm still sipping my coke zero here from it but oh my god like I don't know, just like watching like a well-made cheeseburger because Del Taco does cheeseburgers pretty yeah. well, but that looked like it looked real, but it also looked like like real, you know, like not mass produced. Like I don't know, like like there was some there was some love that went into that cheeseburger. So I don't yeah. I, I was craving it. So that that's a good the, the movie's successful for that reason uh, also. It influenced but, <laughs> you, yeah. That's it totally that's influenced me. Like the subliminal advertising was strong with this one. I wonder if <clears> cheeseburger <throat> stock went up. After like every well, who do you showing, think would, I mean, out, I don't you know, know like, what I don't know what Del Taco is. I, we don't have that here, so I would assume that that right. would have been like a like a, a Mexican like ta- tacos and fajitas, yeah. but they have burgers there too. Yeah, yeah, they do, and surprisingly, they are among the best. Like I take them over like Burger. Oh, as far as fast food is concerned, I take them over <laughs> Burger King or McDonald's or Carl's Jr. or any yeah. of that crap um but uh because also i knew i wanted a burrito and i I put some hot sauce on the burger and stuff oh oh, it's all good i'm sorry if i'm triggering everybody into like getting hungry and craving a cheeseburger but i'm not because i think that this movie like if you've watched it 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 does that itself because like the first time i watched it i I definitely left being like oh i could i could really hold on well it's just i'm 
<laughs> Thinking of the the Jennifer right. Coolidge um, line, except just like replace uh, hot dog with, <laughs> with a cheeseburger. I want a cheeseburger real bad. <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. Exactly. Yeah. Thank uh, you for doing that. Um, <laughs> no problem. That's what I'm here for. But, uh. but um, yeah, and even even now, like watching it again, I just like looked at that, and if I had not just like eaten like. 2000 calories i would have been like okay yeah i yeah. I, I, I could go for a cheeseburger real bad but um it, it definitely looks tasty i i could be tempted another day mm. so kudos to the movie for for being a, like a great <laughs> movie on its own but also making me hungry yeah. yeah. Um, also, I know that it's the kind of movie that like again once you get certain, kind of like scream once you understand the subtext of everything that's going on you can go back and watch it with like newfound vision and recognize uh lines that you thought you understood representing something else in uh you know in a different context now like uh when the exchange between nicholas holt's character tyler oh and also like i'm not doing a premise for this one because if you haven't seen it just see it don't listen to this part go see it and it's streaming on hbo max right now as i speak so go find a place see it come back mm-hmm. and if you've seen it you know and you don't need a premise i think so it's on I'm disney plus but... as well at least in canada oh okay. could be wrong D- disney plus yeah disney plus in the states i think most of the stuff that's leans like more toward thriller and more adult kind of like stuff doesn't go on disney plus but goes on hulu oh, disney's okay. kind of like you know al- alternative I, 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 <laughs> I get it. yeah 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 uh, anyway, disney. um yeah <laughs> okay so no premise no premise just go see the menu. no premise yeah but the, there's an exchange between taylor and uh margo when tyler uh, she Tyler, sorry. You're going to need to do that to me like all day because I am exhausted. Um, (laughs) But Tyler and Margo are sitting there and she he basically um, uh, insults her and she tells him, you can't talk to me like that. And he's just like, well, yes, you know what? Yes, I can, because I'm the one who's paying. Well, first time I'm watching it, I'm thinking like, oh, because, it, you know, these tickets are expensive. These prices are expensive and whatever. And uh, you two, you know, like obviously... It doesn't seem like she's, you know, to the manor born or anything like that. So, yeah, you're paying for them. Okay, you're a piece of shit. Second time around, you realize, like, oh, because she's a yeah. sex worker who is basically his plus one. I don't think she know? was a... So she was just an, she the, was an escort. I don't think that it was explicitly stated that she was a sex worker. There's, there's, there wasn't explicitly. There's a, there's a, there's, okay. a, there's a, there's a, there's a fine line. I'm sure that that people will argue who work in that field. Um, how, however, I, I, on the heels of what you're saying, there, I would, you could even go back further because at the beginning of the movie, when they're waiting on the dock, and you know they're just talking about it, and he says it's like twelve fifty ahead. And she's like, that, well, what are they feeding us? A Rolex, and he, and. Right. There's some exchange about like, well, you know, it's okay. I'm paying for it. So it was like right there that, you you know, you have your first uh, indication of like that, that, you know, when you go back and look at it with those, the, the, uh, the, the goggles of knowing what the situation yeah. really is between them that, you know, things start to make sense from the beginning. Right. And also it's not explicitly stated, but I feel like the, what I picked up was the, the, everything that I was getting from like the, 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 the way that chef was accessing her was that he understood compromise. I mean, she did have to, to sit there and have that man. I can't remember the name. Judith Light's husband had, he wanted to sit there and perform a sex act on himself while she sat there and watched and talked about how she was his daughter and he was his, he was her father and, you know, I, I won't go into any more detail than that. But so she she has crossed that line. Yeah. I don't know that that's her day to day, but that's that's what I perceived. But yeah. ultimately, the the thing that I, I that's the thing that I one thing there was a lot that I loved about this movie. But but one thing that I picked up on really early that I got to see in an interview with uh, Hong Chao while I was setting up uh, the one who plays Elsa, who I quoted. Uh, at the top, um, it felt like a play to me in 
in the in terms of just like the richness of the characters the 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 kind of like uh, relationship context they were bringing to the tables literally to their various tables that they were seated at and and the way that um she made a comment in like this HBO first look thing that I totally don't have a problem believing she said it's not your typical movie it does feel more like a play because even though there are takes where there are cameras on you know, one table, like between two or three people mm -hmm. at a time only. It doesn't mean that everybody else, even if you're not in the shot, just kind of like puts their feet up or even leaves the set. Everyone there's... was there to support each yeah, other. Yeah, there's a full arc like... for every character from beginning of the movie to mm -hmm. the end. Um, and yeah. I love the way that it kind of like every scene just sort of kind of circles around the room and you kind of get a little bit of everyone, like not enough to like form like a, a fully understood story for each one of them but by the end of it when you after you've kept checking with them you you completely know who these people are yeah and i it's fun to what i loved about the first viewing was it's also fun to look back and realize things you pick up on <laughs> um were there uh were not an accident like i remember the first the establishing shot of tyler and of margot um, the first thing I thought was like, oh, are they brother and sister and not that close? Or are they like co-workers? Like I wasn't getting a big, strong relationship vibe. And then at one point, which I is guess, crazy like, for you, because every time there's a, a hetero couple, <laughs> you assume that they're fucking. Yeah. And I didn't. I mean, I did, but I didn't because yeah. at first I didn't because I just thought like, oh, OK, there's nothing yeah. about this. Also, We're not this couple, but a, typical... but, a, but, a, but a pair, a, a male and female pair. Right, because just for like, anyone for anyone listening who doesn't who doesn't know your history with uh, deconstructing relationships within movies, <laughs> he does this but, thing um, a lot. So, sorry, he does this thing a lot where it's just there's two characters and just will yes. be like, oh well, they they had to be in a relationship. Sorry for context for anyone who who didn't. It's been a minute, but anyway. it's been a while uh, since. <laughs> we've been, we've been <laughs> But um, no, because I lit my first note of the movie when I think it, whatever it was, like uh, maybe he put his arm around her. Or there was some kind of gesture between the two of them where I was just kind of like, oh, are they together? And um, the answer is kind of, not really. Uh, <laughs> but then, and then I was just kind of blown away by the cast also because I didn't know. I knew just from seeing the uh, the poster that Anya Taylor Joy is in this, Ray Fiennes is in this, and I think I knew Nicholas Holt was in it too. Yeah, but I didn't know Judith Light, John Leguizamo, Janet McTeer, who I know from theater and from. One movie she made with Glenn Close called Albert Knobs, where they both played women who were masquerading as men. Awesome. And um, she's a, such a consummate actor. And um, and everybody else, I didn't recognize on sight, but I just kept seeing their faces and going like, there's something so familiar about you. I swear I've seen you in something. And I checked everybody's uh, uh, like list of credits and everybody has done lots of television, been in lots yeah. of movies, been all over the place. Lots of voiceover work too. So maybe I was also picking up on their voices. I have no idea. Yeah. But, John um, Leguizamo has been in a lot lately too. He's kind of there's been a renaissance of of John hey. Leguizamo. Well, he was in Leguizamus, a, a Leguizamus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you heard it here first. Um, yeah, because uh -huh. he was in that uh, <laughs> that um, Violent Night. He was the the villain in that. Oh, with, uh, with okay. what's his face Still from uh, Stranger Things as Santa. Right. Yeah. It's... Yeah. Yeah. Um... <laughs> it is what it is. It, not my cup of tea. Okay. Yeah. Um, another thing that I appreciated, though, like walking into it was the... I, I Again, I knew almost nothing going in. I didn't know even know what, what the premise was myself, which is another reason <clears throat> I wouldn't want to like put it out there and spoil it for anybody yeah. um, who might just be listening to this and, you know, not seeing the movie. Um, see the movie. But the... Because the, the thing that I loved was I... I think you touched on this earlier. I... I knew something was going to go wrong, you know, like I knew they weren't all going to just sit there and have this wonderful, you know, like fine cuisine, like, you know, passing, like dabbing their, you know, their, and like, oh, what a sumptuous meal. Let's all leave. And then it's the end of the movie. Yeah. Credits. Riveting. Um, <laughs> so I knew I, I was sitting there just kind of wondering, when are we going to find out that Soylent Green is people, you know, or whatever the, the key thing is yeah. for this movie. Because I knew like, OK, they're, he's either gonna, we're going to find out that he's like feeding them their families or he's going to start 
killing them and feeding them to each other and ma- yeah. make them make them eat each other. Like, I, what, what's the gruesome truth that I'm I think waiting that's to have the, on Earth? Yeah, like that's the beauty of the marketing for this as well, because the trailers don't give anything away. Like, you you get the the, nice. the basic setup that they're going to dinner. And that something is going to happen. You don't know what it is. Yeah. That's that's all you get. And I guess kind of like, because, you know, I'm comparing this to like Scream marketing where mm. the, those trailers are just like pulled apart and looked at from every angle. And you can like sure. formulate uh, the movie in some capacity months before you've even seen it. But this one, like I said, it has the uh, the, the fortune of being set in a single, mostly... Uh, like single settings so even if there are bits in the trailer that are shown from like later on in the movie it's hard to Mm -hmm. to kind of distinguish where it's at when it's happening um but 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 regardless of that like that this is a trailer that knows how to trailer if that makes sense (laughs) absolutely um (laughs) how much did you know like going in your first thing i like the exact same as you and I guess this is obviously a smaller movie. Like, I, th- this was actually um, what the production company, Search Searchlight Pictures, or yeah, something like that. Used to be uh, Fox, formerly known as Fox. Yeah. Well, part of formerly known as Fox, but um, mm. they uh, apparently this was like their biggest opening of any movie that they've ever distributed. Oh, wow. So, but even but even then, it's just like for a movie like this, that's obviously smaller scale. There's not going to be like a plethora of spoilers out there. Like people aren't going to be like going and talking about this movie on Reddit forums and stuff for people to absorb before they see it. Um, yeah. And but I, I, I keep losing my thought tonight. You you say something and I'll, <laughs> I'll circle back to. <laughs> well, I just asked you about your first time going in. If that, if that right, happens, right, if not yeah. A, you know. No, 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 no. That's fair. Yeah. So I knew nothing like essentially exactly where you were at it's they're they're going to the restaurant it's being Mm -hmm. marketed as a horror thriller so obviously something's gonna happen people are going to die i think the most that we got in the trailer was when the uh the pinky is chopped off but the footage that they use isn't like it doesn't really show you very clearly what's happening unless you go for it like through it frame for frame possibly but it was enough to just like tantalize and okay. and, and and pique your interest and i remember like at the time that this came out as well there was a lot of uh, promotional stuff for it in the theaters um maybe this is just here with cineplex in canada but they were they were running ads at the beginning and it was like extra scenes from the movie that weren't in the movie, but it was just kind of like, we ask you to, you know, turn off your devices or something, or there was like a a narrator Uh voice, but it would show these like things from the, like, uh, what's his face, Nicholas Holt, because he had his phone out. And it's just like, you know, we ask that you don't have your phones on, you know, like that kind of typical movie theater stuff. Like, don't don't be an obnoxious film goer. So, I mean, it was was popular enough to, you know, be shown in like every, movie theater auditorium in from in front of whatever the movie was just to, just nice. to like advertise that so i don't know just yeah. is a good word and to i describe the introduction of like these characters who are dining oh to, yeah absolutely from the moment they're introduced i don't see any of these people walk on screen with the exception of anya taylor joy's character like i i know that's one thing i kind of knew was okay if anybody's getting out it's you I don't know if someone else, if Nicholas Holt's going to turn over a new leaf and become good and like get out with you and it's going to be like a, you know, final boy and girl kind of thing. But if no, anybody's no. getting out, it's you. And But I don't know what movie I'm seeing yet, which was nice. I couldn't predict. Well, obviously she's going to survive. Like I was like, maybe she'll just last the longest, you know? I don't know how nihilistic <laughs> the filmmaking yeah, we don't, is. Yeah, because yeah, again, we don't know what's going on. This is part of a, a subgenre of horror that has been really popular lately. I mean, we we haven't seen a whole lot of it, but it's kind of like the the eat the rich. Ah, you yeah. know, I think the probably the best example of this is Ready or Not. Sure. Uh, but even if you want to go back yeah. further, you can you can add your next uh, sure. in with that as well. Just just any mm-hmm. any movie where where the the rich are targeted, and you know the tables <laughs> are turned on them. <laughs> 
I thought about that like a, a, a while after the first kind of actual connection I made with any kind of subgenre aside from Soylent Green um, <laughs> was I started thinking about uh, the 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 movie that I usually um, I don't want to say turn my nose up that just usually doesn't do it for me which is the uh, and we've talked about this oftentimes before where you get a like a, a bunch of strangers together in a predicament. And the whole movie is kind of predicated on like yeah. what what are what are they going to do and you know their actions are going to define ultimately. So who the they uh, are. yeah the sometimes... the Agatha Christie concept, which I love, and you don't, as we we no, discussed not during a, not the, as the House rule. on Haunted Hill. Episode, exactly, yeah. and I I think there's been other ones too. Like we touched on it with like some of the Saw I- identity franchise here and there. No, you excuse yeah, the Saw movies with it, with, which if anything, some of the them, Saw, some of them. Would, and if anything, some the Saw them. movies deserve to be on the bottom of that list. But you you shat no. all over Identity, and that no no that no, actually, no no I didn't say the entire me. franchise. Stop putting words in my mouth. I didn't say the entire franchise. Saw two, I think, is trash. But we'll talk about that oh. if we ever discuss it. <laughs> it's one of the better ones. <laughs> Oh God! Okay, we got to have that conversation then. Mm. Uh, at some point, that's going to be that's going to be a fun ranking. At some point, ranking the Saw franchise. I, but, um, see, anyway. that's a ranking that I don't envy because that's a ranking where just like every single one of these movies is so much alike. Oh, I disagree. I, see, yeah, well, I know you do. I know you do because I know what your favorite franchises are, and they're like Texas Chainsaw, uh, Psycho, <laughs> Saw. You know, where Nightmare I'm like, Elm I'm Street, like, I like the screen. Well, we can agree on child's play. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We can find a happy medium, but like, no, ultimately like, no, that's, that's worth discussing. But the thing, okay. The, getting back to the menu, the reason why I um, think I gravitate to this one more so than I do to the others is because it's not solely about the people who are being victimized and how they react to the, to the, um, situation that they're in uh, either isolated or together it's also about what drove how and basically i guess how what drove the person who's imprisoning them or trapping them to trap them in the first place Mm -hmm. and why he believes they're the ones who kind of like made this happen you know and also okay we just go one by one because um i walk into this movie and immediate, I don't walk in knowing the premise. So I think because everybody who's introduced, who's going to be dining that evening, is kind of so deplorable and, and <laughs> unsympathetic and kind of, you know, like a lot of exhibiting a lot of the worst characteristics of humanity and maybe not even the worst, but just some of the 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 the, 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 the most unsavory. Let's put it that way. Okay. Um, the one the, these are the people who you don't want to be like trapped in an elevator with, who you don't want to be trapped in a situation with, because you don't want to have to depend on them for anything, because yeah. they're going to be worthless. Well, they are. I but, mean, yeah, because yeah. that's kind of just just to to piggyback off of that is that mm-hmm. like these are the kind of people like if this was a zombie movie, they're the ones that would get bitten and not tell anyone. We'll just mm-hmm. we'll just put it that mm-hmm. way. But there's also because these are mostly like very wealthy people who didn't acquire their wealth from, you know, probably any hard work. It just seemed like it was just old money or, you know, or just stole, stealing stolen money <laughs> or just like entitlement. So I think that it's just like that sense of entitlement made it. So, cause there's a line at the end where like, after there's the whole fake out with the, uh, the coast guard that mm. uh, Ray finds even says like, you know, I'm surprised that no one actually tried to escape. Like yes. you probably could have. You probably could have, like, yeah. you know, if you all band together and and you know figured something out. There were there why, points why where didn't they tried you try harder to, to fight back. But yeah, yeah, nobody really did anything, and that was kind of that's that's their their folly, uh, if you if you will, of just like <laughs> of of just expecting someone else to save them. Like not like not having the uh, like just like the faculties to to perform any sort of escape themselves or oh, you know, or survival yeah like n- yeah, no survival sca- instinct <laughs> and that's why and, he, yeah. well for for uh Aaron uh, slash Margot that you know yeah. she is the only one that is able to because she uses you know her strengths which you know end up being her brain and you know her uh-huh. ability to understand the situation and the the the, yeah. the villain that she's up against and like 
really like the i mean we'll get more into this later but just like you know how she's manipulates him and beats him at his own game to the point where it it was almost like checkmate and he knew that just like fuck like i have to let her go (laughs) Well, I mean, do you want to get into that? Because I, I can talk about that, definitely. Yeah. Um, but that's like, we're talking like the, the coup d'etat yeah. of the movie. Um, I Because I, for me, I... Here, what did I write down? Because I wrote down a lot for this movie. I don't want to read all of it, but... Yeah. Um, okay. I saw... Because also another thing that I saw while I was setting up, I had like uh, uh, YouTube videos like running in the background. Hi, Des. Got my cat with me. Um and I, because uh, I just kind of wanted to get a feel like, what is what are other people like responding to? It wasn't reviews, but there was one that was just kind of like discussing uh, the ending. Um, it was uh, from Heavy Spoilers Clips and the, the, the tag or the title was, Did You Notice the Hidden Twist in the Menu Ending? And I was like, twist? Um, so, you know, I just, I just had this stuff on in the background. We can go into it later if we have time. But um, ultimately... Um, what kind of grabbed me uh, in terms of what she was doing was she was appealing. Cause there's a lot of people saying like ending explained and I'm like, Oh God, I hate those videos. But, um, <laughs> but what I got from it, because a lot of people seemed to get that um, I don't, I don't disagree with this, but that she was appealing to chefs because she saw that photo of him when he was younger, like his first, uh, uh, you know, assumedly like his first job. Yeah. Uh, uh, flipping burgers in some kind of like you know greasy spoon somewhere and um, what she was doing was bringing him back to basics and giving him like an access to basically a time well, the time that made him fall in love with food in the first place and I I agree with that but I want but it kept being repeated and I was like well there's a whole section in the movie where there, he actually takes her into his den, like into his office yeah. alone and fully tells her, he gives her a map out because he basically tells her, I haven't found, I, I can't, I'm going to misquote him, but I haven't found joy in preparing food for anyone in a long time. Yeah. And what she does is she offers him a challenge. She basically stands up as an equal and instead of critiquing him, even though that's there, what she really does is challenge him in a language that he can speak and can understand. And the fact that because the fact that he accepts her challenge, she's appealing to his passion. She's honoring him as a human being instead of as a monster. And basically, uh, by doing that, as a result, she ends up being in control. Because now he's doing something she challenged him to. And the only way he's going to kind of usurp the control back is if he one-ups her. And, you know, yeah. rises to the challenge and meets it. And he does. But I, what I loved about it was what it spells out is that even if she is a taker in his eyes. Because he tells her yeah. that's kind of like her, her death knell right before all of that. You, you know, now you're just a taker or whatever. When, she, when he realizes she tried to call the Coast Guard and get help and everything like that. Um, so now even if she is just a taker, she's at least treating him with, re- with the respect that he never got or felt that he was getting from the rest of the group yeah. uh, in that room. And the rest of them are all trying the best they can to offer money or or even just, oh, no, no, I love your food. You know, and they're even doing it to the other chefs, the other sous chefs and the, and the I don't know what the terminology is, but all the people who are working on his underlings yeah. and um, who are working in his kitchen. And, and uh, we'll talk about them in a bit. But that's that's what I love is that that she uses not just her mind, but also just her like uh, her own kind of like ability to empathize with his position yeah. as a subservient person. Yeah. Who doesn't who doesn't get treated with respect? Well, know? she also that, there's there's also like a, a really good line where she calls him out because you know he when she right. first stands up and she's just like, you know this is this is bullshit like this is not food and and he's like it is and it was made with love, and she says yeah. no it wasn't made with love, it wasn't yes. made with yes, it wasn't made with I'm trying to say the line, <laughs> it I'm wasn't sorry, made with go. it wasn't made with love it was made with obsession, <laughs> and. That perfectly sums up what he's all about. And I mean, like, I've worked mm. in restaurants. I've worked, I've never worked in a kitchen, 
but I like yeah. I've seen that I you know I've worked alongside it I I know what it's like there's there's like they're very sensitive and yeah. and rightfully so um like literally like substitutions will drive a chef <sighs> mad and yeah. I think like what's interesting like thematically for the movie and just kind of like her being there is that she essentially in and of herself is a substitution because she was never supposed to be right. there and that's why her presence has like spoiled the entire <laughs> <laughs> experience of that evening for him which absolutely speaks to me i think that's another thing is that this movie started off on the right foot for me as a virgo and as a control freak and as someone who enjoys being in control as much as i enjoy uh serving someone who i respect serving people who respect me you know like if there's a mutual respect harmony like absolute harmony and i th that's what i was perceiving that was another great thing a hook for me with this movie was that it wasn't introduced as like here's the oppressive environment and here's the poor victims it was like here are the here are these people and now they're moving into an environment and com with complete disrespect complete dismissal they're they they they, they, they all in their own way are kind of turning their nose up at it and 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 challenging the staff in all the wrong way. I loved that Elsa, um, <laughs> uh, she's getting like pressed by those three guys who were embezzling or whatever um, about the the meat and asking just like, oh, okay, I don't remember the days exactly. I think it was like 155 days that it has to like uh, cure before it can be served and everything yeah. and if not then it's ruined it's like so what happens if you serve it on the 153rd day <laughs> and she just kind of like puts it in their face this is exactly what happens you die motherfucker yeah. we have your lives in our hands so you bet and she doesn't say all of this but what I'm getting is you better pay us some fucking respect you know yeah. because we know what we're doing we are the experts don't joke about this thing that we care about you know this thing that we she invest our like, lives in in our days yeah she's like one of those uh uh servers that you know those uh specialty restaurants where like the staff are supposed to be rude like that's what people pay to go <laughs> and experience and apparently uh what's what's the actress's name her name is hong chow she was approached by some like well-renowned uh restaurateur or something who wanted to give her a job to actually like come and, and work for her like that's that's how convincing oh she was as the she's what's her amazing. what's her position like maitre d or host she's the maitre d maitre that's d. Okay. that's what she declared in her yeah. interview and also i've seen the thing is i've seen her in other things before this actress um hong chow yeah. i've seen her in hbo's Watchmen, and i've seen her in big little lies <laughs> and apparently i haven't seen the whale yet but she's in that with brendan fraser uh, having a minute right now. So good for her. I'm definitely going to watch it now. Because um, this is the thing. I, this is the first time I've kind of like seen her and noticed her. I want to go back and watch her perform and everything else. Because I'm sure she was just so good. I didn't even know she was acting. And I just thought like, oh, yeah. you know, and accepted whoever she was. She said what it, that she was whoever she was. But um, I thought she was a fucking boss. I had the mad respect for her militancy in the face of all of it, like the rigidity. And again, like as <laughs> as a very token Virgo, I understood the kind of, you know, res not, I keep saying respect. I got to find other ways to say it. Like, the, the, oh, how about this? The dignity <laughs> that you have to uh, 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 kind of like recognize in the people who are serving you, especially in a venue like that. When, it, when the cuisine is like couture cuisine like that, you have to, it, it's al I, I think it's almost like kind of like, for me as a Catholic, like it's almost like going to church and like, okay, quiet, you know? Or for me now, it's more, I, I experience the same kind of like uh, re revelatory <laughs> experiences in like a library. And I love, I love libraries now because, you know, you have to be quiet. You have to be mindful of other people. You have to seek what you're getting without like making a big ruckus and like you can't slam your hand down on the counter and demand service. You have to be patient. You have to, you know, like um, you have to be a decent human being. And I just felt like it, it's, I don't know if anything would have changed if they would have behaved any differently on this day, because <laughs> <laughs> obviously the plan was, you know, premeditated. But right. 
Uh, but if, but even if they would have behaved that way, like in the first time, in the first place, like I don't think yeah. any of them would have been in that predicament, with the it exception, was, of course, of Anna yeah. I mean, they Margo. they were specifically chosen for past transgressions, and then John right. Leguizamo because he he made a bad movie, uh, which I thought was hilarious. <laughs> like, it was just my one day off <laughs> in months, and I saw this piece of shit. Can we talk about that for a second? <laughs> because yes, please. The- that was another thing that like kind of threw me because here I, I was. What was the movie I, I called? The whole... It was like paging Mr. Sunshine. Oh, I have it right Sun... here. Calling, calling Doctor Sunshine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> calling Doctor Sunshine. That uh, sounds like a great film, but <laughs> it's um, no. But I mean, again, like okay, because I, my my uh, sort of sympathy was like resting with like the service staff for a mm-hmm. long time up until uh, the point where Chef pulled up. Uh, what was his name? Jeremy Loudon, the the guy who was presenting the mess. That was the first inkling that I was getting a kind of culty vibe. Before I was just like organized kitchen, good, you know, like this is the way it should be. And then once I saw his his uh, sous chef come forward and like you know buy the farm basically, and <laughs> they're all freaking out and everything, I was like, oh, it is a cult. Oh, it is a cult. Okay, mm-hmm. so I started. Um, to kind of anta- feel, you know, like an antagonism towards Chef, then of course, because now you're doing something oppressive, and you know, you're ta- you're you've you've conned these people or whatever, however you want to describe a cult leader. Like he's, you've swayed these people, persuaded them to just kind of like do whatever they do to please you uh, to, at, at any expense, and then. And, and then we start learning more about him and start realizing the way he sees himself and the fact that he sees himself as like an underling who's there to serve and he's got this like uh, uh, disrespectful public. Then Chef calls Dr. S- basically he says Calling Dr. Sunshine is a movie that he hated and it was his one day off. And he now has become the served, <laughs> you know, the mm-hmm. one who's being served a movie who's like now wanting to send it back and basically what, wishing he could substitute it for something else. And probably, you know, if he could have, have written a bad Yelp review for it, he would have and everything like that. Now you're the judgmental prick, chef. And the so immediately from that, I just got this act of true cowardice uh, that's feeding his I'll show them appetite, if that makes any sense. Like the, this... I don't know. He's assuming the role of victim so he can do whatever he wants, yeah. which seems that's where the movie like really sp- spoke to me, like on a universal level. And when you do something like that, when you put yourself in the position of victim so much so that you've now justified your position as like master controller who holds dominion over like, you know, the, the destiny of like these people who you think wronged you. Chef has now become the judgmental prick. And he's assumed kind of like this fundamental act of true cowardice by feeding this I'll show them appetite because he's made himself a victim in his own mind of all of their neglect, their abuse and whatever. And and basically the world's abuse because he had his mother sitting there. So now he's kind of used that to justify putting himself in a position of ultimate power so he can hold dominion over the destinies of all of these people. And when you do that, I I just wrote, it impedes your growth and grants power to those who wronged you, allowing their negligence or their abuse to define you. And then actual power is reclaimed from taking the lesson, focusing on your own healing process and moving on, which is interesting because I wrote that before I knew the direction Margot Aaron was going to take. Well, Um, because I felt like she took the lesson from him applied it and moved yeah. on well that's you know what, what I mean? that's what i wanted to say is that it, it was almost like every single person there was given an opportunity to kind of turn the tables on him that you know he would have mm. granted them immunity and mm-hmm. in that case you know if he, if if john leguizamo's character what's his character's name by the way Oh, you got me. I didn't write that one down. When when <laughs> when Leguizamo, you know, got up and was just like, "Why me?" Um, yeah. And and uh, Chef said what he said. If he had made the same argument that you had just presented, it's just like, "I'm a, I served you. You're essentially doing this. 
then that probably yeah. would have been an opening for him to just be like, oh, yeah, I see your point. I see your point. And yeah. then, you know, <laughs> oh, like paved the way for him to, you know, get out of there alive as well. Yeah. Do you know what's hilarious? John Leguizamo's character doesn't even have uh, a name. He's just credited as movie star. Oh, that's that's why we, I... I mean, I want to say that's hilarious. why I didn't know, but I, I can't remember anyone's name in this other than <laughs> Margot and Tyler. And Tyler. <laughs> I, what is the chef's name? It was like... Uh, Julian. Julian. It was Slowick, yeah. Julian and then Elsa. Slowick, yeah. And, um, Elsa, of course. Love her. Yeah, but uh, interestingly, Daniel Radcliffe was initially supposed to play the movie star role. Really? R- really? Oh, wow. Yeah. That's a different vibe. Huh. Yeah. I'm glad they went with John Leguizamo, though, because you already kind of have... I feel like Nicholas Holt and Anya taylor Joe are kind of in the same age demographic as him. And I don't know. It's better if there's like a variety of ages there. It feels more... Somehow ages more and ethnicities as well. Yeah. And I feel that like um, Daniel Radcliffe might have been too distracting. Like he might have like pulled too much focus whereas i feel like john leguizamo <laughs> is like you know he understands the assignment like he does everything that he needs to do perfectly and is then yeah. like able to like pass things around no like knock uh towards daniel radcliffe at all but it's just like when you've played harry potter for so long and you're so well known for something <laughs> like that and even have kind of like a name beyond that like his presence here yeah. like it would have been like just think of like the billing for this movie like I think as it is, like, it's just the two names. It's just Ray Fiennes and uh, Anya Taylor-Joy on the poster. So just imagine, like, now we have to fit more names to accommodate, you know, all these other (laughs) high-demanding actors. Apparently, actually, while we talk about the poster, I just wanted to say something about the poster. First of all, I hate the posters for this movie because it's just, it's so basic. I mean, it's... It's kind of, you know, works on an ironic level, just, you know, for for what everything is. But I did notice that... Yeah, yeah, I did notice that the... Well, it's it's boring, too. Uh, You know, I want my big flashy... (laughs) I want my big flashy posters. I want, like, like, you know, like, the the intricate artwork and stuff. Like, I want, like, um, one of those things where it's just, like, uh, Chef... Uh, Julian Slowick is like kind of like this this demigod who's just like bigger than everyone else and he has like his cleaver or whatever and he's like standing over all these like terrified patrons like at their seats like, <laughs> so, no, so nothing that ever actually appears in the movie but just like something creative that you can put on a poster something fun like that but um, no I noticed that the like the one poster there's one of just uh, Anya Taylor-Joy and she's kind of front and center and she's wearing the leather jacket and she's got her arms crossed and everyone else is kind of yeah. like in the background. Um, and yeah. it really reminded me of the poster for, uh, um, fuck, what is it? Dangerous Lies? What What is it called? Oh, Dangerous Minds. Dangerous the Michelle Minds, Pfeiffer movie? yes. The Michelle Pfeiffer one. <laughs> Where she's in the foreground and all of her she's, students are in the background. Cro- she's wearing and... a leather jacket and she's crossing yeah, her arms. Yeah. It's the, someone looked at that and they're just like, hey, I really liked that poster. Let's make a subtle <laughs> homage to it. Except there's no wind machine on Anya Taylor-Joy, I don't think, in hers. But yeah. <laughs> um, um... <laughs> Also, maybe this is a good time to address um, the, the, the yeah. miscasting opinion. Because... Similar to yeah. Daniel Radcliffe, uh, originally supposed supposed to play the movie star, Emma Stone was cast as Margot. Hmm. Okay. I could see that. I don't know how I feel about it. I like. Oh, well, this is the thing. I yeah. I liked what Anya did. Yeah. Um. I I already spoiled that. But um, the thing is, I don't know exactly. Um, Eric's exact reasons for believing that she was miscast, but if anyone if, if anyone were to believe that she was miscast, I would attribute it maybe to her kind of obvious movie star uh, quality that she has. Like she's striking and kind of emits this um, 
I don't know, ethereal beauty <laughs> that is undeniable and that kind of makes you think she's, you know, like a, someone of a particular stature and everything like that. But this, the reason, if that's anybody's reason for thinking she might be uh, miscast, uh, my that's the only thing I could wrap my head around because I thought all the work she did was amazing. Yeah. But the reason it worked for me was, I number one, I know so many actors and uh, creatives who are stunning, like, you know, who look like they, they just kind of rose up out of the sea one day magically, fully formed and just kind of like enchant us with their <laughs> with their presence and their beauty and everything like that. Mm-hmm. And these are people who like grew up in the Midwest who, you know, like who weren't to the manner born and who weren't, you know, like born, you know, to money and uh, access and power and any of that. Like they just kind of like seem to be blessed with you know like bone structure and good skin and, and you know and a huge eyes and huge eyes huge <laughs> like anime style i love her eyes oh, oh my god i think yeah, she's so amazing. captivating but she even um, says her eyes are too big were too big for her stomach oh yeah, yeah. she does that was cute <laughs> but <laughs> But I, I, so I know the, I know that people, you know, like greatness, seeming greatness that has seemed to have kind of like always existed can come from humble beginnings, like in the most unlikely of places or in the most unpredictable of places. Mm-hmm. And that's actually sometimes their ticket out. And for, I felt like what made it appropriate for this character is the, the fact that like, well, Nicholas Holt's character, Tyler, probably wouldn't want to bring along someone who would look like they don't belong. He would want someone who might look like, no, I just brought her, and look, she, she's great. She won't cause a fuss or anything like that. And, you know, she fits perfectly. She's perfectly cast from his standpoint, you know, for like what she needs, the, the, the position she needs to fill and everything like that. But also, I love the fact that like, because it's not so, um, bl- I, I guess, blunt <laughs> and out there, so uh, obvious that she doesn't belong, it gives Chef a better eye to recognize the way she's interacting with the environment, the way she's interacting with Tyler, and the way she's the regard she has for the food or the disregard rather. And it, it makes him, it just gives him, it makes him smarter and gives him a keener eye and makes me have more respect for both of them. Uh, because it's almost like the emperor has no clothes in both cases and they recognize that about each other. Does that make sense? No, I totally understand what you're saying. I would even yeah. guess uh, one one possibility why uh, anyone would would say that she's miscast is because like she's just coming off of last night in Soho, and that was like yeah. a huge like movie for her. Like that was that was like mm-hmm. a, a very I don't want to say campy, but just like it was it was a it was a big role, and yeah. in this movie, it's very like her presence is very understated for what it is um you know i think uh, there's other characters that are more prominent she's kind of like more of an observer here who gets to do more mm. later on but you know from from what we've seen of her of just like how much exposure she's had in like the last few years it's it just feels like uh like i don't want to say it's a, a role that's beneath her but it's just a role where she's not really getting a whole lot to do for most of the movie so that might oh, be a possibility. Okay. And for uh, another thing you just made me think about, because you mentioned Dangerous Minds, I'm just thinking <laughs> <laughs> she's also got that quality that not unlike Michelle Pfeiffer, who is another undeniable, timeless, ethereal beauty. Um, we we but love who Michelle has, Pfeiffer. We I'm love a Michelle picker, Pfeiffer. We're yeah. a Michelle, we, we are a Michelle Pfeiffer standing podcast here. Yeah. But um, she, so Michelle, um, still one of the reasons why I'm such a huge fan of hers is because, and always have been, is because I've always felt like uh, she's not far away. The beauty is ethereal and like otherworldly, but she isn't. There's something so grounded and and earthbound and like you get the intent the, 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 you get the sense that like if you were to have a conversation with her she would look back at you and she would see you she would recognize you at least as a person and listen to you like a person she's very would. accessible yeah. yeah and same thing with anya taylor joy i get the same thing like i was very comfortable with her 
during this movie. I, I I didn't doubt for a second that like the words that were coming out of her mouth were the words that were coming out of her mouth. And yeah. I thought it was a very deft performance, a very, like yeah. you said, understated, and I agree, but also compelling endlessly interesting i was never i was i was never bored looking at her i on screen, I, I don't think like, that i mean like love emma stone as well but i just i can't see her in this movie i know you said you could but i just i don't know but that's the thing i mean you I, you uh, like we we've seen what the movie looks like now that it's just like any other version yeah of it, like like we wouldn't get but i don't know yeah i'm i'm, I'm glad that it was that it was uh anna taylor joy yeah yeah, things happened the way they were supposed to. Yeah. Um, can I tell you? I won't, can I share something with you about Tyler, though? You are sharing it with everyone, um, just so you know that. I'll yeah. share it with you too. Okay. But, but <laughs> I'll share it with all of you. Yeah. Um, Tyler scares the shit out of me because I was watching. Here we're talking about like the group at large, you know, kind of like having this this disregard or this inability to truly appreciate what chef is giving to them and that's what motivates him yeah. and yet tyler is the character who's kind of the other side of the coin of the same coin he's um he's i hesitate to call him the sycophant but he he has definitely drank the flavor aid that everybody else in the kitchen has drank because he's the only one who has no reaction when uh, that guy, uh, I forgot his name already, the one who shoots himself, Jeremy Loudon, yeah. takes himself out, the sous chef. He's the one who just keeps eating and just acting as though <laughs> <laughs> business as usual. And he's not even, like, other people are trying to kind of, like, convince him. Like, Janet McTeer's character, the, the critic, is kind of like, oh, 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 this is the, just the theater. This is just, it's oh, he's just making a art, statement. Yeah. <laughs> it's performance art. Yes. Everybody just calm down. It's, 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 he's an eccentric. Yeah. You know, like, all that shit. Yeah. Um, he's not even going there. He doesn't even need to rationalize. Well, he's focused why. on the food. <laughs> And I think it's just like, but what? the the point, like, even if there were still people who were skeptical, like after the the guy blowing his brains out, it was when yeah. they chopped off uh, what's his what uh, uh, what's her face's husband's pinky, Judith Light's husband, Hus yeah, yeah, um, that that's when everyone kind of was just like, okay, we're in this, and that's when uh, Margot yeah. looked over at Tyler, and he's still just like going to town on his his dish, and she's kind of giving him yeah. this look like, who are you? Yeah. <laughs> like, are you, is it, do you not see a problem with any of this? Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, and it, the thing is, the, I think Chef seeing that and also just everything else prior to that, um, I think he sees him as one of his disciples, but he also sees him, uh, as one of his kind of unruly disciples because he does break that one rule about taking the photographs. And he's not even doing it all that surreptitiously either. Yeah. He's doing it like a person who's gesturing, like Trump playing at. <laughs> well, okay, <laughs> here's my question to that. Because yeah. like, why is he even taking the photos? Because he knows that they're all going to die anyway so like and we know that there's no cell uh, reception either because they say it's, <laughs> they say later on that just like that there isn't any so who is he taking those photos for like they're all going to be dead you know oh i didn't even think about that because he yeah. did walk in knowing like what was going to happen that's what we yeah. found out that he basically hired her to die yeah um good question oh okay i think you i think that he was just uh, that wrapped up like i don't think that he understands the gravity of everything like that's that's how i probably, interpreted it I've just like yeah. like it's just almost like it's so second nature for him to go to a restaurant and take photos of food before eating it. Like he's that kind of person that even knowing that he's, that he's eating his way towards his death, he's still going to do these things that are habitual to him. Right. He's still that. locked. I, he's, yeah. Yeah. Locked into and the it, ceremony of it all. Yeah. And again, like just in terms of like why uh, Julian reacts so badly to him, I just go back to like the whole thing about no substitutions because the, the, the mm. fact that he substituted uh, Ms. Westervelt for Margot. Yes, yes. And and for the but only the... reason, for the only reason, because the only way yeah. he was able to dine is if there were two of them. Right, of course. And I love that she um, jumped over the table and punched him in that. Yeah, movie. me too. <laughs> <laughs> and that was apparently, like, that wasn't in the script. Uh, and yeah, uh, improvised that. But I also feel like the reason why Tyler is kind of my cautionary tale 
for this movie is because he made me think about um, kind of like ultra fandom, not even sycophancy or cult, uh, uh, like drinking the flavor aid. But I mean, but it made me think about just fandom, which I experienced and even like what you and I are doing right now, which is like, you know, film discussion. We take things. We, we analyze them, we break them apart, we examine them, we discuss, we disagree, and share our viewpoints, and then we broadcast it. Yeah. And all of a sudden, it was kind of like when you, like, if you're a kid who eats a lot of sweets and eats too many sweets, and then you watch Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, you know, and you kind of feel like, uh-oh, I probably better, like, maybe cut down on the sweets a little bit and be nicer to my parents. It made me think, it just made me think, like, I don't want to stop podcasting, but it made me think, like, oh, this is kind of like a little boot in the rear for me to want to be a little bit more mindful about <laughs> about what's being presented to me. Not to the point that I am, like, critiquing it just for the sake of critiquing it so I can sound like I know what I'm talking about and so I can belittle others to make myself feel big yeah. or so I can just enjoy things and you know enjoy a status as like a podcaster or something so, like that but well, I'm, not, I'm not done but but also not to just you know like kind of like blindly worship uh the people who create the content that we break like, apart uh, it's like there's Michelle a happy Pfeiffer. medium <laughs> there's i mean she's we, we 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 don't have to get into it, but there are movies of hers that I'm not like entirely like all oh, thumbs I know. up about. You I know, know. Yeah. but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, that's the thing. I don't need something to be perfect for me to yeah. love it. But that's the thing. Another thing is just like love and respect are different than worship and uh, just dobbing. You know, like complete like effacing of yourself in favor of something else. Like I feel like what Chef is doing is easily manipulating like that's what that whole thing with tyler about like making the the cuisine himself when he puts him in the kitchen and it's like this high honor at first like oh my gosh he's putting the coat on me he's putting me in the kitchen i'm gonna get to like do something in front of chef himself and then to bungle it and have your hero your god (laughs) tell you and you know but tell you you bungled it and basically tell you to kill yourself and you do it and the but the scariest thing about it wasn't even the, the the suicide part for me. The scariest thing about it was watching him. He 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 so esteemed himself a foodie, you know. Like he he spent the front half of the movie or the front part of the movie, shall we say, you know, correcting Margot Aaron whenever she would like talk about like food or criticize food and like no 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 you do this and you do that and no, the proper thing to do blah 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 blah. Like, like he knows something, but yeah. the truth is when the shit hits the fan, can he do that himself? No, he can't. And it made me think, okay, I've made movies, but does that mean I know what the fuck I'm doing? No. That's why I tried to come with humility <laughs> and consciousness. You know yeah. what I mean? Like there's a difference. There's a difference. Essentially. Like well, let's, let's um, simplify it here. Tyler yeah. represents a toxic fandom. He represents a... <laughs> A hyperactive uh, fan. Uh, yes, yeah. and uh, he's the he's the one that just like I did not like um, Scream Five, and then uh, Spyglass is like, okay, Tyler, come and make Scream Five, and then he's just like, okay, well, you're gonna have Stu in there, and he's gonna come back, and he's like running a cult, <laughs> <laughs> and then and he's he gonna makes make that his movie, own, and then yeah. and then they're gonna be like, well, that just wasn't good at all. <laughs> And then he yeah. and you failed Wes Craven. Yeah. And then it, it would and, be as if Wes Craven, yeah, himself were to yeah. look you in the eye and say, "That was a terrible movie." Yeah. I've never seen a worse movie in my life, and just walks away. <laughs> but yeah. um. Well, I was. Well, so I just, mean, like Tyler, like is what I would refer to as like if you know if he was a, a character in a screen movie as he's the apathetic friend. And those are the ones who are like they're super cartoony, like they are not realistic people at all. If you if you met them, yeah. but apparently, I mean, like obviously in in this movie, like the these unsavory people, as you call it, like they're made yeah. to be as realistic as possible. Um, but mm-hmm. you know, it, just in terms of um, of scream, like these are the characters who, like you said, like shit's happening and they're just not reacting to it or they're just like it's not Mm -hmm. a big deal or it's like a joke to them 
Uh, like they're, they don't really have any concern for their own well-being. And that's where, mm -hmm. you know, you can kind of like look at him and being like, okay, well, there's clearly something off about this guy that he is so cool, calm and collected in the face of all this chaos and that his, yeah. his, his primary focus is just being like, oh my God, look how amazing this is. Like what, what this, yeah. what this guy's doing. So, I mean, if, if there is a tell at any point yeah. early on in the movie that, you know, he was not to be trusted and he's not going to make it out of this alive. Um, there are plenty of them. Yeah. And if there's also a tell that the opposite, not the opposite exactly, but that, that he's not just like an all consuming rage monster who's hell bent on his vengeance, who's unshakable and everything like that. I feel like it confused me a bit when it was first happening but it didn't really because of the performance Rafe was giving as mm -hmm. chef. But when uh, Catherine Keller presents Man's Folly and tells the story about like how she was basically like a victim herself in his kitchen of sexual harassment, we could call it. I mean, it's certainly uh, unprofessional behavior to like, you know, uh, twice uh hit on someone who works under you and when they don't reciprocate or don't uh uh you know allow you to just kind of like act on what you're feeling um you chastise them by by not acknowledging them and by not even you know acknowledging their presence in your kitchen that when you're a chef i know that that can make you feel like nothing i mean it, it, any any anybody who works under anyone and is in a situation like that where the person who has authority over you cease you cease to exist for them for a time. Yeah. For what, how long was it? Was it weeks, months? I don't even remember how long she said yeah. he just stopped being there for her. And then for him to give her uh, an opportunity, like a platform, essentially, <laughs> yeah. or a, 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 a what's the what's the word you look for the uh, a, a course in this you know evening um, to present. And to basically kind of hold him accountable made him made him more interesting and made me see, okay, so he's not like this, I'm all right, they're all wrong kind of person. He's kind of atoning for his own sins that he's committed and the punishment that he's allotted for himself. I thought it was fascinating that she took scissors and stabbed him in his thigh. At first I thought she was stabbing him in the dick because <laughs> we didn't yeah. see... Yeah, we didn't see exactly where the scissors went, but then when it was revealed when he pulled them out and they were in his thigh, I was like, like your father, you're atoning for your sins the same way they have the opportunity to atone for theirs. They just have to be willing the way you are in your, you know, your kind of sick, fucked up, arbitrary justice mind. Yeah. But I thought I found that fascinating and it, it also gave me, it gave him another layer of like, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not perfect and i'm not uh, you know i'm gonna die too i deserve to die as much as everybody else here yeah and here's why Catherine, take the stage <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and then i love that that the women were left to just kind of sit there and eat the meal yeah. <laughs> well then men... poor poor tyler is like outside uh looking into the window like uh, <laughs> uh... <laughs> Little orphan, just like, not getting right. to it. just like I want to have some of that. And then like when he when they finally all do come back in and they're clearing the plates and he's like grabbing all the shit. He's like, no, no, I still need this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, oh, and also I love just the. Uh, I think that's the point yeah. in the movie where people just start being really candid with each other. That brand of candidness, like that, and, you know, like the way we could deal with one another when we know that there's no hope, you know, or there's no, there's no, there's right, no yeah. savior. Cause, Oh, cause that was another thing. These people, I love that twice. Yeah. They kind of, as a group want to deny <laughs> their situation um, because, or, or basically choose to believe whatever is going to make them the most comfortable because like, that gunshot goes off into Loudon's head and it goes, you know, goes all over the, the tarp and he falls down and he's the dish and they're all trying to make sense out of it. But oh, nobody leaves. Nobody even attempts to leave, really. And mm -hmm. like not in an aggressive fashion that actually might affect some change. So um, it's and they're all kind of doing that thing where they're waiting. Like someone tell me this is a joke or someone 
like come at me with a knife so I know to run. Like I'm, I'm waiting. I'm wait. I'm, I'm trapped between like fight or flight right now, and they all ultimately just sit down and become these docile lambs again. And then the second time, I feel like they do the thing that's most comfortable is when the coast guard comes in. That guy, um, he had a name, uh, Dale, uh, comes in, and immediately they're all so quick to kind of exhale when he pulls the gun out and they're just kind of like oh we're saved you know yeah. <laughs> like it's just the most comfortable thing to believe right now okay of course he's the coast guard and of course we're going to be saved and then when it re- gets revealed that it's what is it a cigarette lighter that he shoots yeah. and not yeah and not like an actual gun immediately it just kind of dawns on them like no you no one is coming to save you no one is Stop looking to other people to define the situation for you. You have to define it for yourself, which is also something that I feel like uh, Aaron Margot does. Yeah. There's also like a very interesting moment between Margot and and Judith Light at the end because she's leaving. Oh, yeah. And she kind of looks back at everyone and they're just sort of accepted their fates uh, or just like still like, are you going to take us with you or something? But she kind of like look. The only person who kind of like looks at her and is just like, "Go on, get out of here." Was was yeah. Judith Light's character. So I don't know if it was just like a yeah. thing like you beat the game, like just go, like don't worry about us. She also did something curious and noticeable uh, right after that when he's about to extinguish them all. Yeah. And I wondered if you had a take on because she thanks him. She says thank you before he like kind of you know presses the button as it were and. They all go up and smoke. Did you have any kind of like reaction to that? Did you believe? I don't even remember about... that. Oh, okay, it happened, and I was yeah. just kind of like, me, my immediately, I was like, well, I don't think she just drank the flavor aid the way like maybe Nicholas Holt did. Was it sort of? Was it maybe more of a thing like she just kind of like had just sort of like succumbed to the situation and was just sort of being like polite because it's just like you know, ser- you know, they're getting served this meal, so she's just like. Thank you. You know, like it just it like too little, too little, too late. But you know, we're gonna we're, now we're gonna be polite about the whole thing. Well, also, it, it did seem heartfelt. It didn't seem like she was putting on airs or anything like that. But at the same time, well, all I could think was maybe at most she's thanking him for ending their suffering. Like they've been. <laughs> She's and she she's feeling it like the whole time. She wears Judith Light is the type of actress who wears can wear her emotions mm. on her face and in her posture, and you know you can just see her and know. Oh my gosh, someone help that woman! So the fact that she's thanking him tells me like she is over this. Just let it, just let it be over, please. Yeah. Thank you. What was you know? she? <laughs> like that's... She, she was famous for for playing Angela on Who's the Boss, right? <laughs> and prior to that, she was on a soap opera my mom used to watch. I can't remember. It was Jennifer, General Hospital or something. I don't know which one it was. But mm-hmm. she she kind of found her way into America's Hearts that way. And then the, after that, he, Who's the Boss was the next big thing she did. And then, of course, yeah. um, she had a long, illustrious theatrical career. And she was on Ugly Betty as like this fierce, you know, like mo- like old money you know, woman who we all yeah. rooted for. But yeah, she's, she's always been great. And she's... <sighs> Love her too. Can't say enough about her. Yeah. Judith Light. I'm just reading this interesting <laughs> thing on the trivia on IMDb. Uh, Uh-oh. So the seven deadly sins are all represented by the six tables, the six different tables and the kitchen staff. So Ooh. the uh, the the table of like the three embezzlers, Soren, Dave, and Bryce represent greed. Um, yeah. Tyler and... Uh, Margo, or mostly Tyler, uh, represents gluttony. Mm. Um, mm. Ri- Richard, who's the the husband's name, uh, uh, who yeah. cheated on his wife Judith Light. Uh, mm-hmm. Their lust, or, or his is lust. Oh, yeah. And <clears throat> and then it says George. So I guess he does have a name, George, who's a washed up name dropping actor. Uh, represents oh. e- envy. Okay. I don't know how that works, but we'll, we'll go with envy. it. Envy. Envy, yeah. Uh, well, let's, we'll, 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 cir- we'll circle back to that. Uh, um, he's covetous. He's covetous of other yeah. of like status and 
how people see him, I guess. I yeah, know, okay. Yeah, that's, that, that's fair. Uh, <laughs> Lillian, the, the food critic, and Ted, who, what, was he her assistant or husband? I, what did you make of that relationship? I thought he was just her cipher. He was her gopher. Yeah. He was the one who she could bounce ideas off of. And also, she probably couldn't well, come he... alone either. Yeah. So she probably brought her minion yeah, her wing. Well, like, well, like, well, like Rafe says, it's just like he <laughs> enables her. Um, yeah, yeah. Totally. They they represent pride because she believes that the dinner was was prepared. The evening was prepared just for her to to right. review uh, for for them. And then uh, Julian's mother, who's you know sitting at the the table by herself, represents sloth. Because she did nothing to stop her husband's abuse. Right. And then the kitchen staff um, represents wrath. Oh. Wrath, huh? Yeah. Probably the most passive and docile, <laughs> <laughs> like, wrath I've ever beheld. I guess. I mean, uh, Well, it's a, it's, okay. a, it's, it's, a, it's a hive-minded wrath. Keep that in mind as yeah. well. It's not, it's not like an individual yeah. wrath. I mean, there's a definite threat. That was one thing I thought was when when he was like, none of you really tried that hard to fight fight or back or anything like that. I thought, well, there are a lot of you. Like, even if everyone at those tables like kind of banded together to fight you, they're outnumbered by about like two to one, at least, I would say. Um, so there's that. There's safety in numbers. But okay, I don't know how I feel about that. Interesting. Um, I also... Uh, 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 there were other things that just kind of like jumped out at me, like little things, like I don't know. There was something about like when she, <laughs> when uh, uh, Margot asks about the the silver door and what's behind it and everything yeah. like that. My mind, the only thing I think of when I think of a silver door is, of course, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. So I'm just kind of like, oh mm-hmm. shit, there's some people back behind there. You know, I don't know what to make of it. Yeah. I didn't. I loved. I also loved the way they introduced some things and then paid them off later, like when um, Margot's in the restroom smoking uh just trying to get her head together and she's looking out the window and she just sees uh one of his minions i guess like walking out there carrying with the wings, white wings yeah. and i'm like yeah and i'm just like oh those are going to figure in later i wonder what those yeah. are for and then when i saw it, i was, I was like, that almost oh, felt oh. like ari aster level of like what are we watching i just feel like there's some like midsummer yeah. set piece that's coming up <laughs> later on <laughs> <laughs> only we're, like, we're gonna put someone in, this... in, a, in a bear and like light them on fire <laughs> yeah only midsummer i think they're arguably about like two different things midsummer is arguably about just kind of like giving into the cult and t- so much so that you ultimately kind of like become at least a, <clears throat> as much uh, exposure we have with well, that movie well, kind of the object of yeah yeah we'll, we'll, we'll that, just but, we'll discuss but that this when, movie. when we get to it because there's okay there, cool. it's open to interpretation but uh, yeah i, I, I also i, I <laughs> Yeah, yeah, well, just the, the wings, uh, the moment of that, of just, like, the setting it up for later. Yeah. Also, with uh, with Lily and Janet McTeer's character, one thing that I loved about her pridefulness, I do agree with that. Um, I loved her bringing up, when they had the bread plates without the bread, and she was bringing up that one little tiny, like, section uh, out of six, I think. Yeah. That, and she just wouldn't let go of the broken emulsion. Yeah. And they just kept serving it to her in these <laughs> giant bowls. <laughs> it was so spiteful. <laughs> just like, yeah. And yeah. I thought that was amazing. I mean, that's again, like, where, as far as the staff is concerned, ultimately, like, given their, you know, their, their kind of mission in, in the movie mm-hmm. overall, I can't get behind it. But from a service position, like, I understand what it is to <laughs> have people critique something to your face that they have no idea mm. about and maybe they do have an idea about but like it's like could you just enjoy something just once yeah like not everything has to be not everything has to be broken apart and has to be like completely just you know like this is what this means and this is. sometimes you can just sit there like that's not that's another thing that i've got like from the movie where i was like I'm glad that I get to talk this all out during a podcast, but I probably won't be very talkative about it in the future. I may just kind of go like, yeah, I love it and just let it. Yeah. Just enjoy I mean, it. I, I let, think let most the people, enjoyment be what it is. Yeah. Most people are very <laughs> passive aggressive when it comes to, you know, especially situations like that of dining out where, and, you know, I, I was a server for many years and it's a yeah. thankless job. And it's like, honestly, 
they're because what as a server what uh, you're supposed to do or at least uh you know the places i worked is once the food comes mm -hmm. out you have about a minute to return to the table and check on the guests and just see if, like yeah. how are the first few bites you know just because that's the 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 quickest opportunity that if there is a problem that you can get it fixed and people kind of a lot of people see that as more of like an intrusion uh if anything it's just right. like like you know everything's fine except for the interruption or whatever but not really understanding that no this is the opportunity that if there is a problem i'm giving you yeah. the the chance yeah. to let me know and yes i cannot tell you the the number of people who just like, yeah, everything's fine. And then at the end of the meal, after they've eaten everything, will then lodge a complaint about something uh, or, you know, wait until the bill comes and then complain about something that way. And yeah. what I love about this movie, just like in terms of like what the the staff gets to do is that they just be like, no. And, you know, like, you know, like yeah. we see with Elsa a lot and just like put their foot down and just like, yes. not my problem. And there exactly. are so many times where, I mean, I may like because I got so sick of, of the service industry that I definitely crossed a line more so when I was a, a bartender in a nightclub because I feel like you can get away with that kind of uh, that attitude more so in that environment rather than a restaurant. But there were certainly times in restaurants where I would just like flat out call people out and just be like, you know, you had every opportunity or, you know, people would say, we've been waiting really long, like, blah, 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 like. I don't know what's yeah. going on here. And like, I'm like, well, remember at the beginning of the meal when I asked you if you had any time constraints and you <laughs> said no, Yeah, that would have been a good yeah. time for you to tell me about what you're telling me now. Exactly. Like, I, you know, I would have in like the most polite way, like almost like a very like reverse passive aggressive way back right. at them to just, just be like, no, you had your, your opportunity. Like, don't, don't fuck no, with if me. They were and if they were even yeah. listening to you when you yeah. were speaking at the top of the meal, you know, like, yeah. I mean, that's, that's another thing. The dehumanization of the service industry and just like i love the fact that like here the only person who's in full reverie the entire time is uh who's who's seated is uh nicholas holt's character yet he does still snap <laughs> at someone and that's anya taylor joy's character yeah. and um because she's the one who he's paying who he can disrespect you know yeah. this this is something, you know, he 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 holds in too high esteem, but he her she's easily like, you know, just kind of like uh, disposable and and can be treated like a someone who Well, clearly is under he's, him. he's the, disposable in the in the regard that he, you know, he brought her there to die. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> but also I I feel like again, like I feel like the whole movie could have been avoided yeah. uh, in any kind of situations that are even adjacent to this could be avoided if, in in situations in environments like, you know, restaurants and whatnot. If if everyone when you went to a restaurant didn't focus so much on the I paid my money, I'm entitled to this. No. You paid your money, so they would feed you, but you are still a guest in their home. Like, yeah. if you could behave <laughs> when you're in a restaurant yeah. the way you would if the parents of a friend of yours were serving you something that they prepared for you, would say thank you, you would make eye contact, you, yeah. you know, without being weird, but you could just yeah. be a human being, you know? Well, there's there even was, the moment, I, like, when, one... when they first get yeah. to the restaurant and he goes up, like, he drags her up to the the, the spot right in front of the kitchen and... and he's then like oh what are you making there or like oh i know what you're doing and he turns around and he like calls him by name and he's like oh you know my name like oh i feel so special and they're like please take your seat now and then they go back and he's <laughs> like he knew my name and and she says to him well it's interesting i noticed that you didn't ask what his name was um just right, to kind right. of like <laughs> turn it around on on him <laughs> but there's this there, there's a very i mean everyone knows the the cliche i'll call it of the customer is always right. And mm. this is like, that is, could not be further from the truth. And like anybody who uses yeah. that, even businesses who will say that, like you're just doing yourself a disservice because the customer is yeah. not always right. However, the customer mm. always has the right to be heard. And that's the, Absolutely. that's the difference. And that's where the, the mutual respect comes in between yeah. the server and the servee, no matter what the the level of industry service that you know that's working on, whether it's a restaurant 
or an escort. Um, there, there is a there is a, a, a line of mutual respect that should Absolutely. be met. And you know, obviously, this is a movie about a slew of people who, you know, not like just really society in general of, of, of this ilk of people who are just represented here by, I guess, like the most notable uh, people among this Julian Slowick's circle of just like customers or people and his associates that he knows that he invited yeah. all of them to, 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 to make this statement. Yeah. I also... I, I, it, I, I, I don't know. I feel like this is <laughs> talk about a feature and not a bug. I yeah. feel like for me personally, this is a feature and not a bug of me. I totally bought Chef's sales pitch at the beginning before they ate and everything when he was talking about don't eat, taste, yeah. accept, and all that. And then accept, obviously, you know, that's the cult leader talking, and I didn't know that yet. But prior to that, I was just kind of, again, I was just taking things as they came. Even knowing what movie I'm in, I'm just kind of like, well, we're still okay. Yeah. Nothing's gone off the rails. I don't know who's going to lose it yeah. or why. But like at that point, if somebody told me taste, accept, and everything like that, like just let let us bring you stuff and just eat it and don't question it. Don't don't you know? Don't pretend like you know better than we would or make demands on you know like a place that's known for its bread and like now I don't get any bread. I mean, come on, <laughs> come on, get bring on the bread. No, don't do just have it. Yeah. Have respect, God damn it! I, that's respect is the word du jour, yeah. and I think it deserves to be. I keep trying not yeah. to say it, but I, I'm just. Well, I love the it. fact that they're like, even, yeah, you know, because uh, you know, he says in his his whole thing or like his history of the food is that just that bread is the food of poor people, and right. and uh, everyone's just kind of like, oh wow, that's so ingenious. Obviously, like there's different reactions from different people wanting bread, but yeah. I love that you know again, like Margo's the one who's like really the most in tune with, you know, with Chef Slowick. Like she might think that she's a pretentious mm -hmm. prick, but she mm -hmm. understands him from that early uh, part of the movie because she even just like looks at Tyler and just like, you do realize that he's insulting you and everyone in this room by serving you this. Right. And, oh, you know, he oh, God. he's just so like into the whole like meal that he's just like, no, no, you don't understand. You know, I think right. she even says at one point, like, "Don't mansplain things to me." <laughs> but like, that was another thing about just like the insult. Like, I love the fact that like at the end when they're all dressed up for their, you know, to go up and smoke and yeah. to introduce fire, With, like the chocolate into the cap, mix. Yeah. They they dress them up as s'mores and because <laughs> I saw the graham crackers and I saw these weird marshmallow things I'm like what is happening and then I kind yeah. of put it together I was like oh right, okay where's the where's where's the chocolate and they put the little chocolate hats on and I was like that's cute but um, I also love that, that chef calls that the most offensive assault uh, uh, on the palate because okay I just want to know personally for you where do you stand on the s'mores because I feel like it's a litmus test with people like some people the people either love them or hate them yeah uh I'm not so really a marshmallow fan okay. I um like just taste wise like I just like there's there's nothing about it that's just really all that for me I love like the <laughs> sensation of like putting a marshmallow on a stick or a skewer and like roasting it over a fire but sure. I don't want to eat it after. Like someone else can have it. I just wanted to. I just wanted to, you know, Aww. make it a little golden brown. But yeah, I'm not. Uh -huh. a, I'm not a big. I mean, that's where I'd probably be like, well, what else you got? You know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I'm I'm with you in terms of like I'm. I mean, I don't eat. I don't buy marshmallows on the regular. Uh, but uh, around a campfire with like people, I've done. I've done it often where we're out in the middle of nowhere and. It's the kind of thing that, like, I feel like a, most people, well, I don't know. I, I guess it depends on who you're friends with. But I, it's the kind of thing that I feel like most people might think is too kitschy or too, you know, like, like uh, it's such a hack thing to do. But then once somebody introduces the ingredients while you're all sitting around a campfire, you're grateful because it's like, oh, yeah, that's fun. Let's do that. And then you get a stick and you put it on the, yeah, I love roasting them. I do love melting the chocolate between the graham crackers once it's over. I will say eating it. Eh, you know, that's a different story. Um, mm. <laughs> it's not, I don't, I don't think I've ever had a s'more and been like, ah, oh, fine cuisine. That said, yeah. I mean, the close, the most s'more adjacent thing I've probably ever liked, because I don't even really like 
some more pop tarts i hope that doesn't make anybody turn off the podcast but um the closest thing i can like it has marshmallows in it and chocolate i like rocky road ice cream that's that's something i'm definitely rocky road never had a rocky road uh and gone ill sorry i'm just quoting marcy from i know yeah i know (laughs) friday the 13th the og uh, (laughs) and i looked in that mirror and i said rocky road (laughs) <laughs> or something to that effect um lizzie you'll always be ugly lizzie you'll always, you'll always be, be plain <laughs> you'll always be rocky road uh, um <laughs> i don't know like i've never i mean like i love dessert don't get me wrong yeah. but usually like when i go to like a restaurant and eat out i'm always so like full by the end of the meal that that's like gluttonous to just be like well I'll get dessert now too or whatever and just like <laughs> I, because I know that I'm already feel like I'm I'm gonna throw up, and that'll just like set uh-huh. me over the edge. And I'm never, I mean, like things desserts in restaurant taste good, but it's always yeah. like such a, like you know, as as the way that um, Margot describes it, just like some deconstructed apple bullshit or whatever. <laughs> I, if right. I'm going to have, like, junk food, like, just give me something basic. Give me, like, a fucking, you know, Reese peanut butter cup or, you know, yeah. like, I'll even have ice cream or, or something like that. <laughs> I don't want to, like, get a dessert from a restaurant, especially, like, a fancy place that's just, like, this thing with, like, drizzle and strawberry oh. stems and stuff. Yeah, I don't, that's... I've never. Oh, been see, I love that, it. Yeah. It makes me feel like I'm eating in one of those American psycho places, and that you know. <laughs> of course. <laughs> of course, I'm covetous of that yeah. uh, in and of itself. Also, Dorcia I'm, I'm a huge dessert. <laughs> Dorcia. Oh my gosh, yeah. I wouldn't need Dorcia. I would eat it like the moose place that like uh, uh, Paul Allen is like looking down his nose at when. <laughs> when, when at Patrick takes him. Anyway, yeah. uh, we already talked about that movie, but um, <laughs> but that was another thing was. This movie made me realize early on, like right in the beginning, when they introduced the amuse bouche. Um, mm-hmm. I've never had amuse bouche, uh, or I don't even know if it's. I mean, amuse bouche is just like I guess the appetizer. It's an appetizer. For the appetizer, right? Yeah. It's the appetizer before the appetizer. Well, I mean, they kind of had a. They had. They had well, they had the 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 thing on the boat, which was kind of like the appetizer right. before the appetizer before the appetizer. Oh, okay. Right. Like, there was just like every every aspect of that of that uh, experience had food in it. Um, it's like a trail of breadcrumbs that they're following. Yeah. yeah. Except for like the tour. I mean, I don't cuz cuz even like the 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 older couple they're just like we've been on the tour. We'll, we'll just wait for you at the restaurant, which I just right. like immediately knew it's just like, "Oh, they're going to die first for that." Um, <laughs> but I loved how when they were like, you know, walking along that path and they're just kind of like walking among the was it like sheep or cattle or goats or something, but it just it just like, "Oh, they're they're right. lambs being led to the slaughter." I thought it didn't they make a uh, a comment about like it being goats like uh, uh, uh what's her name the the food critic um Lillian didn't she yeah. make a comment when they were eating um the uh the man's oh shit I'm forgetting all the titles now uh the 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 what was it called the man's, man's thing folly? <laughs> man's, the man's folly man's thank man. you See, I told you you're gonna have to spot me. Um, yeah. The <laughs> when they're eating the man's folly and everything, like, didn't she make a comment about like how, or maybe it was earlier than that? She was doing. I think a it was earlier. About something, something about like goat. You can t- Yeah, maybe it was the amuse bouche. She was eating something. Yeah. She's just like, yeah, you can taste the goat. Like, why would it be? Good? And I'm like, oh, whatever. Yeah. But that's the thing about this whole amuse bouche. The only reason I know what amuse bouche is, I think, is because it was referenced in an episode Hannibal. of Friends. No, <laughs> you know what? Actually, it was referenced in that, but I forgot about yeah. that. But it was also referenced in, that's how I remember it. I think Monica serves Chandler something and she says, it's an amuse-bouche. And he takes a bite of it and he goes, well, it is amusing. That's the only reason I know, <laughs> mm. have any kind of frame of reference for amuse-bouche. So I'm an uncultured swine. Yeah. But I was so I was grateful in the beginning when they first started kind of like those uh, those subtitles or the, you know, the, the captions telling you like the amuse-bouche was... But then I was wondering, like, is it missing a... I'm so, I'm so not a foodie. I, I'm like yeah. an aspiring foodie. But it said it had cucumber melon, but no comma between the cucumber and the melon, even though it looked like it was little, like, tiny spheres of I cucumber think, well, and of melon. I think I that tell. an amuse-bouche is not, like, a specific dish. It's just right. a... It, like, it, it's, a, it's a course or, like, a pre-course. Yes, yes, yes. It could be anything. Right. It doesn't necessarily have to be... The little like pea-sized melon balls or whatever. No, no, right. Yeah. 
But is it is there such a thing as cucumber melon or was it did they just forget to put the apost the the the, the comma i think it maybe it's just kind of uh, melon. <laughs> infused with like cucumber something or other i don't know i don't okay. know i'm not a foodie yeah. i order I <laughs> listen listen i order pre-made meals because i hate cooking ah. and that gets delivered once a week and i have my meals for you know like for six or seven days i am not a food yeah. i don't know shit about food despite yeah. i think when i worked in restaurants like i knew the menu because like i basically read it a million times that i could you know recite certain things but i didn't know like i would be like the worst employee yeah. for for julian because he would his whole thing would be like you just know the like the menu you're not in love with it you know like yeah, like going the way that he is. <laughs> at least, well, at least you being not a foodie. At least you don't yeah. wor- use words like mouthfeel or anything like that. But don't um... say mouthfeel. <laughs> <laughs> he got it. But um, hmm. oh, that was another thing I appreciated though. Like from uh, uh, uh I keep st- tripping over her name because I know she has two: Aaron, Margot. Um, yeah. Just call her Margot. I started to th- what. I got worried for a split second after the wonderful cheeseburger moment because yeah. he gave her the bill or he told her it was nine ninety five, and she put a $10 bill down on the table only. And I was like, oh, is he going to get pissed off because she's not tipping? Because that's a definite no, no in a restaurant. Yeah. And then like a few moments later, he talked about how gratuity was included. And I'm like, that's why she got away. Yeah. Because, well, <laughs> because I mean, she, the, the, the 12... includes the gratuity. Yeah. <laughs> Well, the tw- I, th- I don't know if it would have been included in that, but the the twelve fifty was you know part of the the price already. But wait, they never paid because I thought they had already at the at first it made it sound like they had already yeah. prepaid for the meals. But then at the end, you're right because they all put their credit cards down on the table. But yeah. I don't think anyone paid. I think it was just a formality. No, I mean, they're not... Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Again, the ceremony. Yeah. I, I think I, I brought up church earlier, and I feel like that's exactly... It's a cult church, but yeah. it is a church nonetheless. Or a, 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 a place of dogma practice, you know? In, yeah. in, in, like, <laughs> so... Um, what so, do you yeah, make so of... I, I think that's what all that was about. What, what do you what? make of, like, his, like, chef's quarters, like, you know, his own private home and like the 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 layout essentially being the same as the the dining room um i think it speaks volumes as to the way he lives his life and the way i i i just try to put myself in his position yeah uh and imagine that like well then i'd always be home no matter where Mm. i go yeah. I'd always be in a place that feels like I just rolled out of bed and now what am I going to make today? There's no there so in that sense there's almost like a lack of formality even though he wants everyone to kind of like have this reverie of him and of the the honorable, you know, space. It's also a sacred space, his version of it where nobody else is allowed to tread in his particular wing and then he I love the closed off section though, the almost little cave that he has with his with his his exposition wall and you know (laughs) i I wish everybody had that because that would be so much more helpful if if all the people who commit the worst atrocities could just have a wall of exposition in a tiny little corner of their home that we have access to or one of us has access to and they could you know ultimately recognize the human core of that person in them. It's and a that very, would... <laughs> or even just to find out like what the, what the threat is. It's a, it's a very lazy uh, writing technique, but one that I'm like, okay with in a way. Cause right. I just Me love too. like the discovery of it. It's just like, you know, it's um, like stumbling into like, Oh, I wasn't supposed to see that. And just like the putting everything together. Like they, they may as well just like have the strings and just be like, connect him like, Oh my God, it's him. (laughs) And yet at the same time, like, yeah, it, I mean, you know, because again, like we talk about the way another Friday, the 13th reference, there's a lot of them in this episode, but um, (laughs) the way Adrian King is framed, you know, and the way we're just kind of like, okay, you're obviously the final girl. And I feel like even though it's not a framing device for Anya Taylor-Joy's character, we, I still feel like the movie's presenting her. Like if anybody's going to survive, she's the one. The, the the framing, for lack of a better term, <laughs> no pun intended, 
of his photo of him standing there like uh, flipping the burger or whatever, um, you know that that's going to be significant later. But what I love mm-hmm. is when she stands up and starts defi- challenging him, not defying him, but I guess mm-hmm. kind of defying him, but really challenging him and speaking to you know, the, what he's passionate about. I still don't know exactly what her plan is because if she takes the wrong step, she could get killed a little early or she could just get, you know, her finger chopped off or something like that. So it's like, all right. um... (laughs) Oh, and also I just wanted to say in case anybody heard heard, that you mentioned the the finger being cut off and you said it was his pinky. It was his ring finger because his ring fell. Right. Yeah. When uh, when Richard got his finger cut off, I thought that was significant Mm. because it's like you won't be needing this chop. But um, but ultimately, like being able to recognize the human core of somebody who does something monstrous to you, I like that this movie basically says that that is something that can save you. Or does it? Which leads me to one question I want to ask you. What did you make of that last moment with her on the boat and she starts biting into the cheeseburger? Did that have any particular significance to you or feel like things were kind of unresolved yet at that point? No, I just... Saw that as like not for me either. You know, that was just kind of like the, uh, um, the uh, like the the Shawshank Redemption moment of just like you know coming out of the <laughs> the, the, the hole and just being like, oh, I made it, or you know, whatever. Or like um, Samara weaving, smoking on the steps. Yeah, they're like, even, covered in well. Blood. Yeah, that's a that's a great comparison since those. This is almost like the ready or not of the service industry. Um, and just just her like taking out the burger and just being like, chefs or, you know, something or just because, like, yeah. Yeah, because that was one thing that was interesting to me. This channel, Heavy Spoiler Clips, asked, did you notice the hidden twist in the menu ending? And the twist that they noticed, they're not positing that this is an actual intended thing, yeah. but it's just a question. And I, I, I wonder what you make of this. They noticed uh, that earlier in the movie when they make that crack about the meat, when they're, you know, about it being cured, what happens if it's, you know, served, you know, like two days early or something like that. And um, and how you can die. Yeah. They, po- they wondered if the reason, another reason that was being introduced is, is there something Chef knows that she doesn't? Like, could he possibly be handing her the keys to her undoing like yeah. he wants he, he made sure that if somebody got in the boat and somebody got away they could only get so far and he'd give them and because she asked for a cheeseburger perfect i'll give you the tainted meat yeah. and gave it to her so maybe what we're looking at is you know one of the last moments of hers before everything that elsa described that happens to you yeah. happens to her and for me I, I well i wanted to know for you like what what do you make of that does that give you i mean i feel like it, just, just through a different lens to bring it back to your favorite movies ever saw i feel like if that was the twist <laughs> stop it would have to be there'd have to be this thing where she starts butting into the burger and then like has this look of of realization and then it starts to play that dun, 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 you know the song music <laughs> and then it's like a flashback to elsa being like well we could serve it a day late but then like you would you know book like whatever she says right. and then it's just yeah, like this yeah. like quick cuts of like the everything that happened in the movie and then and then Margot like <laughs> dropping the burger out of her hand and just like starting to choke. <laughs> That's how I would have interpreted it if if that was the thing. In this case, like how the movie played out, no, I don't agree yeah. with that ending. But I think that would have been hilarious uh, uh, me, if it me was. Too. <laughs> I mean, it it definitely would have been bleaker. I don't think that's the movie they made. I think there's a lot a lot more to everybody in this movie. I don't feel like the the, the filmmaker intended. Uh, us to necessarily or intended everybody necessarily to carry that away with us but um i felt like that that earlier moment with elsa was much more about kind of like you know the disrespect just one more example of the disrespect that these people have for you know what these what these people invest their lives in the thing that bothered me the most is when the one guy like sat down on one of the beds it's just like what are you doing yeah someone sleeps there for like four hours a night yeah Again, again, yeah. that motif of like you're moving into someone's home, but um, yeah. So I, yeah, I agree with you. I, 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 I prefer to think she gets away, and that uh, like it, it just makes it more interesting and makes her the final yeah. girl I want her to be. I, I'd hate to think that that, that doesn't feel like the movie. That well, was even being made yeah, here, it's just bleak and everything is no. There's no escape because in Ready or <laughs> Not, when we did that episode, uh, 
I brought up the question of just like, does she get away with everything? Because it was, you know, there's all these dead people, uh, right. et cetera. And then you're like, well, no, because there's like the, the pit of and the, like the, the goat barn or whatever Mm -hmm. like they're gonna find like the skeletons from years ago like it's like she's fine she's she's gonna be okay and i'm just like oh yeah you're right so i and i didn't get anything like the boat broke down it's going to be daylight soon you know the coast Mm -hmm. the real coast guard is going to come and it wasn't a long boat ride either it seemed like it was just kind of like across the bay like they even said at the beginning it's like oh it's just a short ride over to the island so yeah i'm sure and even like they they this was at night, like someone on the the land on like the coast would have seen the fire and been like, sure. oh, something's going on at, at the old Hawthorne place, you know, right. send, <laughs> send police boats. So I'm pretty sure like. that Margot was going to be fine. Yeah. Aaron, also, yeah. I remember feeling relief when I just saw that huge floodlight, like at the top of the boat. I was just kind of like, "Oh, okay, somebody might be able to see that in the distance." You know, if yeah. they're no one's going to be coming from the island, so if they're going towards it, they'll see. It. I also, was mostly just glad that she radar. was able to <laughs> finally have a meal, and I think the fact that, like for you and so many other people, that it kind of inspired them to <laughs> go out and get a burger to eat afterwards, like that, just sort of like yeah. leaves the movie on a happy note. And, yeah. you know, I, I can't I can't find any hint or inkling that there's something nefarious beneath that ending at all. Like, it just seemed like oh. she got out and this is her. That, like you said, it's the Samara Weaving celebratory mm-hmm. cigarette. She's got her burger and uh, crinkle cut fries. <laughs> <laughs> Which makes me happy. Also, I, I got to say at the drive through. I think I'm usually pretty nice to the people who serve me, but I, I was really, extra really nice. happy. Yeah. I was extra nice. I, I made sure that I was making eye contact, maintaining it, but not in a creepy way. And I even told her before she told me because she had other things going on. So I was just like, have a good night. And she was like, oh, you too. You have a good night. And I was like, thank you. And I just drove away. <laughs> I was like, oh. Okay, they're not going to kill me. (laughs) We need more of that in the world, though. Just those kinds of exchanges, you know. Del Taco won't be cursing my name anytime soon. I hope, but (laughs) (laughs) unless they're just like, you should have had more variety in your life. But I doubt it because you know I'm keeping them afloat with all my purchases anyway. Definitely, um, I did (laughs) also. Yeah, Yeah. um, I, I I'm not sure if you noticed, but the cinematographer. Is someone uh-huh. that we know, uh, oh. P- Peter Deming, who was the uh, the cinematographer on the Screams one, two, three, and four. Oh, I mean cool. one, one to three, and then there was you know that other one uh, that looked like the way it does. <laughs> but um, this the, the movie it, it does have like a very unique look to it as well. Wait, he was a director of photography on Scream Four. I'm looking at it. No, right he now. was. I'm, I'm just, I'm just, just for the sake of like, <laughs> saving face for him. <laughs> I still like that movie. Yeah. Anyway, all right, cool. No, but you well, don't good. like the look of it. But uh, no, I, I yeah. never see. Look at you putting words in my mouth. I never said I didn't like the look of it. I and I'll it and, was okay, and I'll quote. It's just like it looks choice. like every scene in the night scenes. It's way too bright, and in the and in the day scenes, it's way too dark. I don't like that. That's not a direct quote. <laughs> Go back to the pod, people. Go pod, people. Go back to the pod. Pod on people. Forum and listen I to what I like, actually said. Don't no, believe this propaganda. This might have been on like the old, <laughs> the old, old pod. No, I don't think I critiqued it. I think I just cited that it was that everything was dark. The daytime was. We dark. have talked about how as dark as the nighttime. But ugh, I'm not going to have this discussion again. Go go to the Patreon, <laughs> listen to the old pods, and and come back to me, somebody in the DMs, and let me know what yeah. I said. <laughs> anyway, yeah. All right, the, cool. um, well, good for him. Yes. Good for him is the point. Absolutely. Yay. I mean, I just love when Great there's job. any sort of, like, scream connection to, to a movie. Mm-hmm. It, just, it just makes my heart happy. The production design was also done by Ethan Tobman, who worked on the Exorcist series, which look oh, beautiful and he also worked on of all things beyonce's lemonade movie for 
to accompany her album, oh. which is visually stunning. Mm-hmm. Um, he, yeah, uh, I want to see more of what he does in the future because it's good stuff. He knows how to create a mood. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. yeah I guess b- b- before uh, we get to the cherry picker, I'll just say because um, mm-hmm. like this was one of my favorite uh, horror movies yeah. of 2022. I think there, I think. X and Pearl, like absolutely, definitely my favorites. Mm. I, I really like Bodies, 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 and this one as well. Um, and mm. I just, and just like to note to like compare because I know um, we were talking about uh, Barbarian a few weeks ago, and I think like the sure. issues that I brought up with that one were specifically in the second act, where we as an audience knew more information than the character did in that instance with Justin mm. Long. Um, like that was my issue there in this movie. Um, in, in contrast to that, why this works so well for me is that the characters know all this information that we don't know as an audience. And I think that that makes a movie or at least a screenplay infinitely more interesting because we should always be a step behind. We shouldn't know what's happening before the characters do. And that's, that's kind of like my, you know, my biggest critique with with that movie and like where I feel like a movie like this, um, you know, gets past that uh, that problem with that you know you would find in a script. Yeah, and just to piggyback on that in terms of like what appeals uh, and what I feel like this film got right that I might critique other films with similar situations uh, for is so so often I feel like directors r- r- and screenwriters with situations like this rely on the reveals of the truth uh, in the situations be- with the people between themselves who were stuck in, in that in that predicament. But with this one, I feel like all of that is interesting, but also secondary to our, our major foe and our major hero or heroine. Um, just kind of like the, the watching them relate to each other and watching them just kind of like uh, like what what makes them what binds them together and makes them similar, but also what makes them diametrically opposed to each other. That 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 kind of stuff uh, I eat up with a frickin' spoon, for lack of a no pun intended, for lack yeah, of a better term. Sure. But 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 yeah. Um, so I uh, yeah I I agree. Twenty twenty two was a good year for horror. This um, I I don't know if I I I got an opportunity to see Bodies 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 a second time and I like it. Um, but I think I might prefer this yeah. one. I, I, to, I still have to watch, uh, watch. Yeah. Yeah. I still have to watch BBB again. <laughs> All right. Okay. Yeah. Let's let's get to the cherry picker. It's not like we killed people. On purpose. First order of business, we need a cherry on top. Um, I mean. <laughs> I. Well, I am going to go. Personally, with Elsa, I don't know if that's where you're. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh my God, no. that's great! <laughs> no, I think that's amazing because I adore her. Um, mm. I I want to just put on the table, uh, make sure that she gets her due. I I don't think that uh, Margot Aaron is any slouch and deserves absolutely you know, not a seat yeah, at the yeah. table, as it were. But, um, but, but she's, she's, I think she's a great final girl. I think she might yeah. be one of my favorites in recent years. That said, yeah, let's, let's give it to Elsa. She's she, well, everything. I mean, she, yeah, she stole every moment that she was in and every yeah. line that she had. Whereas like Margot, like she was there, but she didn't kind of like turn up for me until later on. Um, I miss Elsa when she's gone. Yeah. I really miss her. Absolutely. But I'm like, you need. To, I obviously yeah. I know. Okay, if you don't kill her, she will carve you up. Yeah. Like she is just kind of like it's it it, it, it can, there can only be one. Ah! <laughs> you know. So I I respect. Like I said, I respect her militancy, and I I love that performance. So I am yeah. happy. Yes, Elsa, Excellent. Elsa, Elsa. All right. So for the cherry picker. Last week, yeah. we we asked you who deserves to die the most in Army of Darkness. I mm-hmm. nominated Evil Ash. You nominated Sheila. And yeah. across Patreon, Instagram, and YouTube, the vote was 536 for Evil Ash versus 192 for Sheila. 
Oh, thanks, guys. Thanks for trying. Thanks, <laughs> thanks for, for showing down. up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sean P. says, can't believe I'm the first to vote for a change. Love both of these characters. Evil Ash is hilarious, but he's still a bad guy, so I pick him. Love both of you guys. Look forward to your thoughts on the new Evil Dead. Me too. It's going to happen, yeah. We still got we still got 2013 mm. to get through. Yeah. Thomas Baker. I pick Evil Ash because when we see his uh, literary skeleton crew exploding the camera, uh, exploding, comma, um, the camera goes to him and he started making that first time having sex noise. It was hilarious. <laughs> Dude, I don't even remember that. No, I need to, now I need to watch it again. I I, I mean I I I trust Thomas Baker. I I'm, I'm not going to watch it again at least not for a while. Um, <laughs> so I don't need to, but yeah, I, I'm sure it happened. Right. Uh Movie Maniac 03 probably should be Evil Ash, but I can't even remember who Sheila is, and that is way worse in my opinion. <laughs> it's Emma Davis. Wow. She's the girl. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> for anybody who doesn't know who yeah. Empath is, yeah. It's funny that, like, there's, there, like, we, or just, like, you uh, in particular have, like, spoken with, with such, like, reverence for, for Empath Davids. But it's, like, now yeah. twice for, like, the two movies that we've covered that she has appeared in, 13 Ghosts and Army of Darkness. It's just, like, she must die. Kill her. Yeah. <laughs> she, <laughs> Well, her characters, you know, they have each have their own yeah. reasons, but I don't, I don't want her to die. No, 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 no. But I, it's, it's just funny that just like she's, she's so popular, like within the horror genre, um, but then it's like played <laughs> these like characters, yeah. Who you know we can say that she's a slouch. Um, <laughs> so anyway, yes, my <laughs> chunky Jordy Sheila is just useless. At least Ash lets you know what he is. Evil. <laughs> Michael 92. Give me some sugar, baby. And that, that was my that was my impression of Oh great. Of, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh J- J- Jayton Pasco never watched it, but I'm voting for Sheila because it's too easy voting in the evil option. Fair mm. enough. Okay. Johnny Pendergast <laughs> says, I feel like I voted Sheila just to be mean, but thinking about it, without evil Ash, there's no evil puppet Ash, so my vote stands. All right. Blueberry says, Off with her head! <laughs> kind of a vocal minority here. Yeah, uh, that's great. Meme City. Good, bad, I'm, I'm the one with the gun. <laughs> and okay. silent saturn says evil ash ash in general really he was a dick in this film <gasps> uh he looks oh. good in a ripped shirt though yeah that like something. the little the, the poster <laughs> the artist rendering of the poster right right yeah. right that's cute <coughs> excuse me um, so go for it so the menu i yeah. mean this is this is difficult because I do like this character just in terms of like a like the narrative that is presented, but it's just it's so egregious what he did of mm-hmm. of inviting Margot, knowing full well what the the consequence of that would be for her. So it's easily it has to be Tyler. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm not going to vote my conscience or my heart this time. <laughs> Cause honestly, like at first I was like all the people, cause that's a really good one. Yeah. And I'd like to, I'd like to get back in my winning streak, but, <laughs> but, um, but it might be interesting. Cause that, he might be too annoying for me to ever win this, but because mm-hmm. originally I was going to, I was going to say Dale, the coast guard, just because what he did was beyond shitty than all the other because all the uh, the other kitchen artists like at least weren't giving anybody any hope but the fact that he seems to be a member of the cult as well 
but full on donned a costume just to kind of like gotcha i thought that was shitty but i don't think he's gonna win against tyler so the only person i can really put against tyler and have some kind of faith that he might win, even though I and I don't find him terribly interesting, but what he represents and what he brings out in the other characters is interesting. But uh, I'm going to say Richard, the old man, the philandering husband, because um, there's nothing redeemable about him. Yeah, and there's nothing. And like I said, there's nothing terribly interesting about him either. And as a person, if he were a real person, I have issues. You know, he has issues that I, I take mean, issue he with. is he's <laughs> he's masturbating uh. in front of in front of someone who resembles his daughter. That's just weird. And making and then making her tell him she's his she yeah. is his daughter. Yeah. Uh, 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 gross, gross, rich old white man. <laughs> so <laughs> Just uh, don't mean to bring race yeah. into it, but it's it, it's there. Sorry, it's been done. The die is cast. And <laughs> anyway, that's who I it's choose. Very, I it's choose been Richard. a very white cherry picker lately. I can't remember the, <laughs> the last time it wasn't a, a white. Uh, well, I'm not going to choose any of the people of color, especially for this one. Because number one, like all those guys at the table, like the, mm-hmm. the table that has all the, I don't, I don't even remember, was it embezzling technically that they did or yeah. whatever? But they were yeah. all non-white. They were all people of color. and so, But they were all kind of equally offensive. No one of them I felt it's, like. Yeah, it's hard like, to. And just as per the rules of the cherry picker, you can't pick uh, collective um, amounts of people. No, it has to be one no. or the other. And I think with, with yeah. that, like you, you run the risk of. It's almost like taking like the whole entity and just like cutting it into like a sliver. It's just like it's just a third of a person versus all yeah. of, of one. So that would that would have been my mindset too, because I think that like they were pretty awful in their own right. But Richard right. is a Richard is a respectable choice for the chopping block. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah. interesting t- turn of phrase, like yeah. respectable. Yeah, for the for the chopping block. I'm more so meant to chopping. Uh, is the, yeah, the emphasis on chopping yeah, block, yeah. not respectable. Yeah, <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> but anyway, there you have it. You can vote your heart, vote your conscience, help Eddie yeah. get back on his winning streak. Because I guess no, you're you're no longer playing just for for shits and gigs. You're now here for the no. Because I was winning for a long time there. It felt nice. I liked it. Yeah, I'd like Sometimes it again. You just, you just you know, it, it just takes one bad nomination, and I guess yours was she. Yeah, <laughs> I knew it who wasn't going to win. I knew who, she. She would if she would have won yeah. over Evil Ash, I would have been genuinely. Well, shocked. I mean, the thing with that movie is just like as we explained, it's just like yeah. there's no like who do you root for, who do you root against in this movie? It's like single yeah, white female yeah. all over again. It's just like there's the dog, you know. Like. <laughs> <laughs> there's the cherry on top. Yeah. 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 All right. Okay. So again, vote your heart, vote your conscience. Uh, you can vote on Instagram. Our Instagram is at the Cherry Picker Pod. Follow us there as well. Mm-hmm. You can vote on YouTube in the community tab. Uh, subscribe to us. That is the Cherry Picker. Uh, you can also vote on Patreon if you are supporting us there. Please do support us on Patreon. I do have uh, some new supporters I want to welcome. So uh, say hello to Mark Craney the second and Wyatt. Yay, hey. Mark and Wyatt. Yeah. And of course, if you are supporting on uh, on my Patreon, that's uh, Zach Sherry, uh, you do get access if you are uh, subscribed to the Freddy Krueger tier for all of our bonus episodes, which is the Cherry Picker After Dark. This yeah. month, uh, or this, this past month, we did Buffy the Vampire Slayer Season 4. Next month, pending... We'll talk about that after. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, more cherry picker content for for you to enjoy. So consider uh, checking that out. Um, and then I also wanted to thank Andre Felix, who is our podcast editor. So Yay! thank you, Andre, as always. And um, what else? What is my 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 a list of things I have to go over that I can never <laughs> just just do it all in one um but if you are new to bullet points i mean i kind (laughs) of do but i just like it's reading and i and i already can't do it at this point but (laughs) if you are new to the cherry picker 
You can obviously <laughs> listen to these episodes if you are watching us on YouTube. So the RSS feed right. link is in the descriptions down below. And like I said already, we have our YouTube channel. So if you are listening and you want to see our, our faces, you can go watch it over there. Edward, yeah. where can they find you on social media? If you want to see more of my face, go to Instagram or YouTube and just search Edward is truth one word. I should pop up there. What about you, Zach Cherry? My main YouTube channel is Zach Cherry, Z-A-C-K-C-H-E-R-R-Y. Instagram is Retro Bitch Face, all one word. And Twitter is Zach Cherry 8. <laughs> what do we got going on next week? Okay. Is it the one where the there's a play? No. <laughs> it belongs to childs. <laughs> like from the thing? Not childs from not not from the thing, but like from children, but it's like, you know, and but it's happening for children the Children of the corn? No, but for the second time. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Is it child's play too? Yes. Yay! I mean, yes. I mean, <laughs> yes. I don't know what that was. Anyway. You'll be reading the premise for that one. <laughs> oh, sh I have to? I've got homework to do? Okay. Yeah, in the Chucky voice. You said it. You said you would. Oh, in the gosh. We did agree to that. Yeah, okay. Well, yeah. thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. And come back for Child's Play 2. We will be right back. <laughs>